So there's the customer cues and then there's the industry norms. It's like third base. We got to stay within kind of what standard practice is. And we really can't deviate too much out of the packaging or the, the practicing norms. Hey everyone, this is Mark DeGrasse, the President of Digital Marketer, and this is the podcast that keeps you up to date on everything you need to know when it comes to digital marketing, from the platforms you should be focused on to the kind of news, tactics and tools that are working today. Today, our guest is Stephen Frey, the adorable founder and chief brand scientist at Quantum Branding. And I am very excited to have, have you here, Stephen. Uh, you know, we don't have enough branding and uh, creatives on here, so I'm excited to hear about uh, brand science. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks. Hey, thanks for thanks for having me, and thank you, listeners, for tuning in. And uh, excited to share with you, uh, hopefully, uh, a lot of great stuff that you can dive in and apply to your business today. Oh, I'm I'm positive that that's going to be the case. Uh, you know, it's funny because I, you know, I'm a big AI, uh, you know, predictor, uh, kind of looking at how it's going to affect the market, the world in general, and especially marketing. And one of the things I always talk about is that the the lifetime value, uh, you know, the customer's lifetime value. That's going to be a core metric moving forward because getting new customers is going to get increasingly expensive as things progress. So if you don't have a good brand, if you don't have consistent imagery, if you don't have a culture surrounding your business, then there's a good chance you're going to go out of business because you can't just keep acquiring new customers the way we've been able to for the last few years. So with that said... Uh, a lot of people think branding is just, uh, oh, my logo and my slogan and the colors that I use on stuff. I'm branded, but you have an entire science around it. So why don't we just go into what is brand science and what does it mean for marketers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so keep me from going down the rabbit trails here. But <laughs> the the big picture is that there's a lot of conversations about branding. And this one's kind of a more evidence-based one. So you may have a lot of great thoughts and, and have some thought leaders that you listen to. So we just want to supplement that conversation with this one. We're not trying to, you know, kick anybody off the bus, but the bus is actually a really good metaphor because there's probably a couple of things you learned when you were younger on the back of the bus from the cool kids, like the birds and the bees or cussing. And that probably wasn't the best definitive source for you to learn about those things. So Kind of, this is kind of what I, what I want to do is is instead of learning from the back of the bus from some of these folks on marketing that may or may not be credible, we actually kind of want to supplement what we're talking about with kind of an evidence informed view. So simply stated, marketing is just the functional promotion of trade. Back in the days, you used to trade a rooster for some wheat or some cheese for you know some some grain. And, and there was a functional trade and you would see that, oh, this is the blacksmith. This is the mercantile. And there's little placards, you know, in your tiny, tiny little, you know, quaint British, you know, or Renaissance style town. Well, fast forward, you don't make phones. I don't make cell phones, you know, cars. You don't make cell phones. How do we know whom to buy from? We live in a digital economy. So we have digital marketing. Uh, we have regular marketing. We have print. We have web. All those forms of marketing are just saying, hey, do business with me. Step back. How do we know whom to choose? Well, then there's mnemonic or memory devices within that, such which is branding, which is the color, shape, word, story, sound, music, different sensory assets that help us remember. And so that's how you remember. Oh, I remember that jingle or, oh, it's the sign and drive event. Oh, yeah. Let me check out, you know, that car. Well, let me check out that phone. So then brand science is just the study of how do we make branding more effective and how do we understand how to get the most bang for our buck? How do we make the best experience possible? And how do we complement, you know, those conversations about branding and emotions and, and things that you already have with an empirical base. So brand science is simply the study and the implementation of a more effective, uh, the most effective and optimized use of your brand's assets. And then discovering how do we increase uh, that mental availability uh, from there? Because at the end of the day, and that may be a new term for folks, I want to stop and say mental availability is just mm -hmm. thinking first of someone. So it's like when you go to the grocery store, it's who you reach first for in the dairy case for milk, or it's the brand that you go to first when you're hungry, you know, when you go to the gas station, 
you know, you've been driving by billboards this whole time that say open happiness and Coca-Cola and 99 cents, you know, in, in the, in between the meridians of the gas station. So when you walk in the store and then you actually grab a Coke, it's because they've been building those memories and refreshing those memories. And so memories is actually where the science of all this lives. Uh, so the memories of how we create brands is all related to our minds. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the 30,000 foot view. And we can get into more, more on that. But that's kind of the, the 30,000 foot view. It's sensory assets, it's memories, and then the study of that, how to make it more effective in your marketing so that you can help attract those customers. You can share what you do and they can think of you first. I love that. Well, I love the concept of sensory assets too, because I think, you know, before it was, everything was kind of visual, you know, billboards, if you look at the evolution of marketing and then maybe a newspaper ad, and it was that, that visual aspect was a big important part of it. Now we have so many uh, different mediums to experience brands. So you do have the audio through podcasts, you have the visual through graphics, pictures, and, uh, you know, what was I think videos, <laughs> uh, and we have all these different methods that you can consume information. So it has gotten more complicated. And I, I think for for brands, you know, everybody when you think of branding, you think of Apple, and you think of Nike, and you think of Amazon. You think of these giant brands that have these million dollar, billion dollar budgets where they can expose everybody to polar bears because they're trying to sell Coca Cola, and everybody knows the polar bears. And so I think I think there's different levels of branding where you have like, OK, you're thinking of big business branding where they could essentially throw a million dollars at anything they want and it doesn't matter or it's going to add to the brand because they have that kind of exposure going on all the time. Now, for small business, it's different. You can't set up 50 billboards around your town. You can't set up one billboard, it, you know, even printing a uh, three by six uh, banner might be too expensive for you. <laughs> so so in terms of uh, kind of getting those sensory assets on the smaller business side, maybe not micro business, but on, you know, say the boutique down the street, um, how could they implement that kind of brand science into, uh, you know, less scalable methods? Sure, sure. So what's interesting is, is you brought up some really good points that I want to point out, or points, point out, uh, things that I want to mention that you you said, you know, yeah, you talked about how things have gotten more complicated. Actually, what's interesting is, yes, technology may be more complicated, but when you look uh, as the, as technology has increased, we've gone from print and then we went to radio and then we went to, and then we went to TV and then we went to digital and computers. And so uh, instead of thinking of it as more complicated, just think of it as more census. You know, if you look at the advertorials back in the day, there used to be long form content, just long paragraphs of what it would be like for for, you know, a wife at home to cook, you know, uh, dinner for her husband using the KitchenAid mixer or using ivory soap. And and so those communications fit that time period, but they're not effective today. So when you look at the change of of marketing you see that marketing is always implementing what is the most up-to-date current means of communication today. So this gets really weird because then all of a sudden we have people uh, who are now implementing marketing who are wanting to help you, but they may just be marketers in name only. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dan Russell, he has a book uh, called Snake Oil and he calls them minnows. So marketers in name only. And the importance of that is that, yes, they may be an expert with this one thing, but they may not understand how this fits in the big picture. So that's why it's really important to understand, you know, your own brand strategy. Uh, the, then you mentioned some great examples. I always mention the polar bears. I love that you mentioned <laughs> the polar bears. Uh, so, so polar bears are just a great example of in the sensory wheel of word, shape, color, sound, story, music. Uh, that's kind of a character. And so we have the, we have Santa Claus, and you notice it's a specific depiction of Camp Santa mm. Claus. He's the rosy-cheeked classic, and it's always commercials for Coca-Cola classic that feature Santa Claus. Why? Because there's this concept of the archetype of the everyman in this kind of universal utopia that Coca-Cola is is seeds throughout their communication. That's their lens, their archetype lens. So everything is about this universal feel about something that everybody can appreciate. Mm. So what's one thing that everyone can appreciate is also polar bears. So that's one more asset that during the winter time they pull out 
And it's just another lens, another way that they can tell the story about opening happiness or sharing. I think they even had penguins recently that, the <laughs> you know, the polar bear is like helping the penguins. So then they have Santa Claus, they have polar bears, they have penguins. And each year they're adding assets. And this is actually a really great strategy that small, growing, developing, purpose-driven brands. If you feel like your business or organization or brand is something that A, you're passionate about, B, you want people to know about, and C, is the reason you're either working this job or is why you're put on this earth or a little bit of both, then listen up. Because what Coca-Cola does is they have a cacophony of distinctive brand assets. Uh, word shape, color, you know, color, color combination with shape, they have package. So they're creating all these sensory assets and they have over 150 and counting that are unique to them. The average small business doing 2 million or less typically usually only has three to five. So in our model of making memories, and in fact, this is important to know that 95% of the time we're using what um, Nobel winning, um, Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist Daniel Kahneman says is system one. System one is 95% of the time. It's always absorbing. It's always acknowledging what's going on. It's seeing and helping you navigate with the sciences that I explore. Um, sequence of cognition, shape, color, content. And then interpreting some of those things in kind of these little boxes, like a March Madness bracket. It's why I can say, hey, Mark, think of something in the fridge that's white, that's in the door, that's in a jar, that's a condiment, and that's also a vegetable. And then usually people get stuck and they're like, uh, mayo, 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 horseradish. Uh, oh, if you're really weird and you like Chicago style hot dogs, you have chopped onions, you're weird. We love you too. Uh, but so there's semiotics, how we organize thoughts. And that's uh, that's culturally and contextually. So this 95% of our brain is always gathering information culturally, contextually, helping us navigate. We see the stop sign. We know that means stop. Uh, System one is why we can drive, listen to this podcast, and drink our coffee and know to stop. System two is like 15 times 37. Is this a good investment if the PMI is more than 29%? Blah, blah, blah. It's like the heavy lifting. So in that 95% of the time, our brain is acknowledging our senses and gathering and making memories. And so those memories are like little super highways in our brain. The bigger clusters or nodes there are together, the more memories and associations. So polar bear, red, cola, Christmas, happiness, shape. There's a big node in your, in your brain of cluster of memory nodes. And so people are going to think of you first. So we said, okay, the bigger the node, the more people are going to think of us. So how do we do that with our small brand? The average small brand typically just has our brand name, maybe a color, maybe a tagline, and then the colorized use of that. So it's three to five. So there's actually a tool you can download. I'll give it to you to put in the show notes, but it's a distinctive brand assets checklist. And it literally just helps you walk through saying, hmm, do I have a brand mark? Yes or no. Do I have a name? Yes or no. Do I have a color? Yes or no. And it goes through each of the categories. And once you go through the categories, when you check those out and you get through the assessment tool, um, it's the brand science checklist. The, we'll give you the link in the show notes. It's easy. You can do it yourself. You'll feel like a rock star. You'll feel like a brand scientist. It's the first step. So feel like a brand scientist today. Download this checklist. And the goal is for you to see how many you have. And the goal for your assets then is you want to say like, hmm, is this distinct to me? Or does everyone use this? A great example, Oreo. Oreo cookies, when you go in the aisle, and I use this and it may be, it's the same, the principle is the same for service-based businesses. But Oreo, the packaging is blue. But the little use of Nabisco on the corner and the words Oreo, yes, that, that makes you know it's Oreo specifically, unless it's a different flavor. But sometimes brands are near knockoffs of each other. And it's the distinctive assets they have that help us make us sure that we're buying the right one. Toilet mm -hmm. paper is the same way. Uh, it's either super wide, super tall, bad math in the corner, and and soft, fuzzy, you know, animal baby or, or creature in the middle. 
uh, telling us how soft it is. And so the goal is what? So we have category norms uh, that that help us identify, you know, oh, this is soft, this is strong, this is economy. So we go through the checklist and and we want to identify which ones are the most distinct and which ones are the least distinct. And that's really the starting point. And so uh, the rubric or the metric that we assess them by um, is by how famous it is and how distinct it is. And if you're small, it may not be famous yet. So what we can work on is making sure that you have the most distinctive ones um, in your field. Uh, but the principle here is we want to make sure that it fits your category. So a lot of people talk about being different. And I want to encourage you, let's update that word as well. Let's maybe use the word distinct. Mm. Because at the end of the day, if you're in a, say you are a cookie, you know, manufacturer and you have cookies, you have to be a cookie. If you're too different, you're a cake, your pie, your crackers, your chips, you can't really innovate within that category unless you make a whole new category and then you still get shoved in another category like Swiffer. So so at the end of the day, you want to utilize characteristics of like almost like baseball. We got to get to first base. What are your customers looking for? They're looking for soft, crispy, crunchy, chewy, chunky chocolate, gluten-free, you know, um, high end, you know, what are the characteristics they're looking for? And actually those are not like that people call positioning. Positioning works for you and me. Um, like when we're talking about what it is, but for the customer, it's not like this educational thing. That's actually another thing that brand science teaches us that it's actually, we want to reach emotionally distracted viewers and help them notice our brand and notice who we are. And then they notice it, they're attracted to it, and then they get it. Oh, cat food for kittens. Oh, makes sense. Oh, it's come, it's chicken. Oh, great. Like some of these things are just qualities about your cookie or your cat food or your company. And then, so there's the customer cues and then there's the industry norms. It's like third base. We got to stay within kind of what standard practice is. And we really can't deviate too much out of the packaging or the, the practicing norms. And you may have seen this, you'll go to like a conference and you'll see like everyone kind of has like the same look and vibe. And then there's like someone who metaphorically has the chicken outfit on. Like they're like giving away gift baskets or they're doing something weird and nobody's at their, nobody's at their booth. And you kind of, there's like the guy that's like got the chicken outfit on or like there's usually some marketing gimmick. It's too far outside the norm. And so we want to make sure that we can reach our customers, we can third base, fit within our industry. And then this is where we get to hit the home run. We hit the home run because we hit the ball where everyone else is not. We may have a chocolate sandwich cookie, but we have other descriptors or describers or qualities about our cookie that makes it a high-end cookie or it's in parchment cups or the distinctions that help people know, ooh, this is a Mark cookie or this is a Stephen mm. cookie. It's a butterscotchy oatmeal you know, that's soft and chewy or a white macadamia chocolate, you know, chocolate white macadamia nut. So those are all metaphors that I use. So the rubric back to our brand assets is that you want them to be distinct. So, uh, and if that's something that you're interested in, um, there's, we can share, uh, we've got more information on our blog about that as well as um, in our course that we offered called Brandpreneur. But the goal is you want to identify how many brand assets do you have and make sure that they are distinct that people can recognize them. Um, and that's really the first starting point. Uh, the average small business starts with three to five. We want to get you to at least 15 to 20. Oh, 15. Oh. And then 15 to 20, you know, you've got three colors, you know, single color combination. You've got some words, you've got typefaces, you've got some specific photography, maybe some specific illustrations, you know, and then maybe a character or a mascot. You know, you're kind of the character or the, the figurehead. They're a digital marker. So you're also a brand asset. So we would include you. So if a small business or a company is has a person, you know, um, I'm Tom Baudet and I'll leave the light on for you. So not only do we have Tom Baudet at Motel 6, we also have the music of that commercial, the little jingle and the sound of his voice. So there's four assets right there. Mm. So um, it's a sensory experience. So the more that we associate, so we associate Mark's face and his voice. So those could be two additional two additional brand assets mm. for the brand. So, so the first step is seeing how many distinctive brand assets you have. 
You want them to be distinct to you. No one else uses them. And you want to make sure that they work within your category because you don't want to alienate your customer or your industry so you can hit a home run. Wow. I love all of that. Hey, everyone. I want to quickly interrupt the podcast for a special announcement. If you're listening to this podcast because you want to become a better marketer, then I want to share with you what I believe to be the most comprehensive digital marketing program on the market today. It's called the Digital Marketing Mastery Certification. You'll learn to leverage the tools and channels to predictably and profitably drive awareness, lead sales, and referrals. Everything you need to know to become a true master of digital marketing. We'll take an in-depth look at the core digital marketing competencies, including content, email, social media, community, digital advertising, data and optimization, and more. After earning your digital marketing strategy certificate, you'll have the tools to effectively reach your target audience through a full scope marketing strategy. Get started today at digitalmarketer.com slash strategy cert. <laughs> he said a lot. And what's funny is you're kind of just describing the basics. And for a lot of people, I mean, they're not even close. They're they're not, they're like halfway to first base, uh, based on your analogy. And well, for, for me, how you describe it is is fantastic. Cause a lot of times I'm trying to explain the system one, system two, uh, you know, system <laughs> that you described. And I'm usually like, okay subconsciously, you are constantly categorizing information. You don't realize you're doing it, but you're doing it because your brain is lazy and doesn't want to have to remember all this crap individually. So it groups it all into these different sections and you don't even realize it's like it's RAM. Happening. It is. Yeah. It, well, because you don't have time to process, you know, you, if like you look surveillance at surveillance your... footage plus RAM, oh, plus, well, it's... plus the Dewey Decimal System or I don't know. Well, and then you have this in internal environment because what you were describing with system one is all the visual aspects and the, the kind of touch and feel you're driving a car, you know, but when, when we're driving and even the sense of vision, you could perceive 10,000 things at a time. That's your your standard field of vision. That's what you can perceive. Can you understand and categorize 10,000 things? No. <laughs> and so, and when it comes to branding or, or trying to find something you want to purchase, like there's no way you're considering all those factors because it's just too much work on top of the fact that you don't think these things are important or that they're happening or you don't know that they're happening. So I think having the system one, system two, where 95% of your attention is actually you know, uh, automated. And then that 5% of the higher level is where you're thinking about things. But to reach that higher level, you have to hit all these brand asset points. Otherwise, you're never going to get there. And one of the things that, you know, marketers always talk about is, oh, you need seven impressions before somebody acknowledges your brand. Whereas, you know, now we talk about like 20 or 50 and somebody like, uh, you know, Kasim, one of our contributors says you need 500 impressions in order to sure. break that barrier. Sure. So, but I think that the way you kind of system systematize it and also have the the brand asset concept where you're able to group all these elements of branding and marketing into that's one asset you got and here's another asset you got. And then you start to see yeah. how cohesive those elements are uh, is super complicated and difficult. So it just it's it, kind of like dating. It's kind of like dating. This is a really good metaphor uh, for anyone out there who's romantic and the other partner is not, uh, you know, like getting taking out the trash. The, you know, maybe the husband or someone, you know, the partner that takes out the trash, they may feel like, hey, that's like five points. And then getting like uh, a bouquet of flowers is like 10, like 15 points. If, if garbage is 10, surely flowers are more than 15. And then like maybe they buy you a castle. Like that's got to be 10,000 points, right? No, one point. Each thing <laughs> is one point. <laughs> oh, consistent, consistent, consistent experience you know, reinforcement. So some of us are microwaves, some of us are crockpots. And those of us who are crockpots, you know, emotionally and, and socially, they want that consistent behavior. And that's really a great way where we need to shift our, our past view. Our past view was all about positioning and differentiation and message comprehension and persuasion and teaching. And it came with the idea that we really, at the end of the day, thought that, that customers were rational, involved viewers. And actually, they're not. They're more emotional, distracted viewers. We're kind of just orbiting them. And we're just lucky if, if they choose us. And, and when they do, then we pull each other under our gravity here. And they're, attra they're attracted to us that they get you get noticed. And that's really what it's about, is you've got to get noticed. Um, uh, when I was working on Mars, Pat Gary came up with this phrase, unseen is unsold. Mm. People don't see you. You know, if somebody comes to me and says, Steven, I've, I've got a, I've got a sales problem. It'll be like, 
So uh, where are you sharing yourself? How are you sharing yourself? Do you have any distinctive assets? What is the name of your company? Well, uh, well, you don't have a, a sales problem. You have a leads problem. And in fact, you don't have a leads mm. problem. You have a brand problem. Nobody knows about it. So it's really all about reaching. Instead of teaching, it's about reaching. And then just little exposure. Oh, color, shape, word, create a memory. You know, And it's building those relevant associations. That's why I can say like, oh, Mark, are you hungry? Well, you're not you when you're hungry. And then you're like, ooh, hungry? Why wait? Have a Snickers. And then you think about the commercial with Betty White and 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 all this cluster of nodes. And then after a while, those fade. So there has to be a strategy about refreshing them and keeping them up to date. You notice this, if you notice that, I, I just Coke is just the quintessential best example I can provide that majority of people who exist on the planet know about. It's easier to get Coke than it is to get clear water, clean water, uh, it seems. So so they refresh. They put, you know, during football season, they'll put little footballs on there. Why? Because they want you to tr- use, you know, I call it man Coke or Coke Zero. They want, they want you to have man coke or coke zero at the football games Mm. and then diet coke and and so they refresh the packaging so it looks slightly new and it triggers a new like oh awareness but you don't really register it but your brain does Mm. and so what it does is it scooches it it's like a ticket system it scooches your your brand back to the front of the line because then as the memory starts to fade it's literally like the movie inside out where like your mind is like oh we don't need these memories clean them <laughs> awesome. and there's these little guys like i don't know that that's scientifically a- accurate but metaphorically it is that that your brain doesn't keep information if it's not valuable so the more that it's prompted so it's all about salience and being known and so uh there's not really a rubric that i've discovered as far as touch points because the context of the experience is subjective the context of the geolocation is 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 unique but yeah any any just the principle of the more experiences you have with people and the more sensory assets you have there's a better chance of them remembering you you creating a memory and them becoming and so things like Facebook Pixel, and even you and I were talking before the show about how Facebook and other things, you know, you say, you say, yeah, I'm thinking about going for a walk. And it's like, want a dog? You know, adopt a dog. Here's some sneakers. Here's a great, you know, running course. You should app, you should download. Like, like some of those things are intuitive and helpful be, because they they prompt what our actions are, but we don't follow up if there isn't a memory associated with them. Mm. Or a, so so that's why exposure is like, ooh, here's that, here's that little ad again. Here's that little ad again. Because they know that after a time, you're like, oh, I, I see that now. Your brain saw it before. Your brain saw it 20, you know, exp- you know, exposures before. So so this is really, really important. Um, no marketing activity is better than any other one from an empirical stance. We, what we, I really would love for folks to see that the goal they should, the goal in and of itself is to hold on to or improve the mental and physical availability of the brand. Mm. So if people don't know about you, obviously it's to improve. If you're a category leader, it's to refresh and maintain. So there's really three factors that that big, big companies that we look at that invest all this money, they're the same three factors that we care about. It's mental availability, physical availability, and scale. We're just not at the place where we can maybe scale yet, but we can address everything else. So mm-hmm. if you're familiar with like EOS and traction, that that model where, you know, you kind of have like traction, growth, scale, authority, you know, you want to get up to the authority. The first thing you have to do is build your brand platform. That's mm. the most important part because those are the assets you're going to be using to go from test, you know, optimize to scale. And what are you going to use to drive those mental associations except your distinctive brand assets? So it's literally like Bob Ross, like, you know, which assets are we going to need for this upcoming campaign for digital marketer? Well, we've got, you know, Mark's going to be doing it. So he, oh, he's got his AI book. So there's those assets. And then, oh, and then there's the program title. And then there's the colors, the brain mark. Okay. So we've got maybe seven we're going to use as the main, like, it's literally like a palette, like Bob Ross. Mm. And you can pick the more assets you have, the better the chances you're going to be able to find a recipe of which ones to use that are going to drive the most relevant associations and build the best structures for that thing. So don't hear me that like, well, Steven said I have to have 20 
or, you know, that's a great starting out. You may not have any sound or music. If you're not doing, you know, broadcast or, or video, then that doesn't make sense for you to invest in those assets. So you really want to invest in those, those kind of 15 to 20 core. Um, and if you can get it up to 30, you know, it's a small business, start there and, and, and go from there. But the goal is the end of the day to drive the mental availability. So all your marketing, that's, that's its goal too. So sales, sales is just hatching, hap, helping capture the effects of your marketing. So everybody's on the same team. Nobody's on a different team. So it's all about mental availability. So all of a sudden you realize, ooh, social media ads or Google or pay-per-click ads or video or email campaign, they're all working together to help people increase that evidence-based view of salience, distinctiveness, getting noticed, relevant associations, building those memory structures and reaching the customer. Oh, well, I, I love that. Well, and it's funny because you go into these really complicated concepts, you know, in terms of branding. And I, I love the example of Snickers because I think if you do everything you're saying right, then you're able to violate basic principles of living, which is what Snickers has done. Because if you think of food, uh, you're really hungry. You're literally grumpy. Your body is not functioning correctly because you're so hungry. And the first thing that you grab is a Snickers bar, 300 calories and 60 grams of sugar. And that's what people reference right. when they're hungry. That's not right. right. <laughs> that's completely right, wrong. Right, right. But, and but they've actually... Well, they've used the marketing you, and the branding to make that something that people think of. Oh, when you're hungry, right, you grab sure. a Snickers bar. No. Sure. <laughs> and actually one of the, there's the, and there's several characteristics about that. Like the, the packaging on Snickers is strategically tighter than other mm. candy bars. So it looks like it's bursting out. Like it's really, really big uh, and full of, you know, all it's good. Full of nutrients. And, <laughs> and, and it's. Now they never make any nutritional claims, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> but but it's interesting because they're using a simple human condition and associating a word and a condition that's very universal. So there, um, you know, that one is also you know the everyman um, archetype. If you're not familiar with archetypes, archetypes are simply um, a motivational lens, and they're developed by uh, Carl Jung, um, psychologist and. And simply, there's your inside world, your outside world, yourself and others. And so uh, there's, you know, everything from the jester to the teacher to the explorer uh, to the sage uh, to the magician. There's there's a variety of them. And they simply are a motivator. Um, it's what is the motivator? Why am I doing the thing I'm mm. doing? So it's if just simply changing the motivational lens, think of Campbell's soup. If Campbell's Soup changed their motivational lens to the sage, would we buy it when we feel sick? No. So Campbell's is, is a good example of, you know, caretaking, nurturing, you know, Dove, some of these other brands, Ivory, you know, taking care of. So, so the motivational lens behind Snickers is the everyman and when you're hungry. And so everyone can relate to being hungry. And so all the jokes are about what can people identify with? And so, you know, you're not you when you're hungry and, and all these jokes, they're very universal human elements, which brings up a really, really great point that most people don't realize. We think that you have to be really big to do mass marketing and change your messaging. But actually, if, if we have a complicated view of who our demographic is and our buyer and basically say their name is Chloe, who's 33, lives in Chicago, she loves Pinterest, she loves the color deal teal. She has a French bulldog and she shops at Whole Foods. That's a very limiting view of your customer. And so uh, what we want to do is shift not having a demographic based view based on their demographic things. There's only a couple products out there that really, really like really, really, you know, having to do with biological things uh, for men and women that are appropriate, like, you know, for that's all we'll say. So, but other than that, the majority of products out there don't have to be made pink or blue. And we're seeing that. And so when they're made universally that all people can enjoy them and understand them. Yes. Now, sometimes it's for, you know, you may have pet food. And I say this, to share this example because it's top of mind because I've done work with Mars Pet Care. You know, they, in Asia, they make packaging very smaller. Why? Because it doesn't make sense. They don't have a lot of room. So they're hand feeding their animals. 
So if I have smaller packaging that helps fit that problem, then I also have it to the age and stage of the animal. And then based on the ingredients, what I want to feed them. Oh, grain free cat food in small pouches. So that's that's appropriate for me to say like, oh, yes, they live in an apartment or geocontextually they live in in small areas. So but really, it's when we look at the problems we're solving that can be broke down into actually a, a more strategic way to look at our customers. And in fact, instead of trying to get all of our customers to buy all the time, we want to have a like a stacked version of our sales strategy. Say like, um, you ever go to like art shows or, or craft fairs mm-hmm. and you see like stuff on the table and you're like, ooh, that's cute. And then it like sucks you in. So I do pottery. And when I do shows, I strategically do that because I know when I do an art show uh, that I may like sell a tiny bowl or a Christmas ornament, I will never see those people again. And that's a good example of light buyers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Coca-Cola, if you drink less than two a year, um, if you drink two a year, you're a heavy buyer. So just one is all Coca-Cola needs to sell to you. So to be a light buyer, you only have to buy one Coke a year. Yeah. How many people are on the planet? They're at such a high level of scale. If they can, you know, have everyone just buy one a year, they're great. Mm. So we have light, mild, moderate, and heavy. We could even simplify it and just say light, medium, and heavy. Uh, well, I know all those concepts are awesome. And I think what we'll have to do is probably have you back on, uh, to talk about more advanced concepts of brand science, because sure, sure. Even you just mentioning the basics is just, uh, so far beyond, you know, cause, cause for me, you know, I did brand development. I, I helped micro businesses and startups develop sure. their brands. And I was kind of like trying to convince them of, Hey, we need a color palette. Uh, was difficult enough, much less all the elements you're talking about. And we haven't even talked about the newest element in branding, which I think is the, um, you probably have a name for it, but the emotional value that people put towards the the brand's mission and vision and what they, their principles, what they stand for, which is an element of branding. Sure. I don't think anybody has really cared about up until the last 10, 15 years where- sure the development, especially in the food industry, because if you told anybody in the food industry 20 years ago that vegan and non-GMO and all these different elements would be significant factors in branding, they would have laughed at you because they would say like, "Ah, nobody cares enough. And and here's at the end of the day, those are actually just great examples of design congruency. Um, Like we're talking about the, the ball diamond, really the customer, they're looking for these cues. And those cues may help them navigate the category. Um, it, they're they're not. It's it's like saying like, why do we love Mark? What's the one reason? And you're like, no, mm-hmm. there's he's 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 sharp. He's funny. He's clever. He's articulate. He's caring. He's a great dad. Like, no, there's so many reasons. Because why? I have memories about mm-hmm. Mark, and hopefully all your your loved ones do too. And, and people that know you there at, at digital marketers. So it's, it's, there's never just one, there's never just one reason why people buy you. It's the combination. Now there may be one that catches your attention. Oh, he's mm. tall. Oh, and that, that, you know, or, you know, oh, I, was it a crowd? I heard him laughing. And then, you know, I was like, oh, what is, I should meet him, you know? So, so the, it's interesting. Science currently shows that brand attributes and the how things make us feel. Um, there's a lot of subjectivity in that in that conversation. And everybody talks about, you know, you need to focus on the emotional experience, the emotional experience. And yes, I can tell, um, I can create an experience that has an incredibly, incredibly deep uh, impact. But what's interesting in the customer experience, it's actually more of a feedback loop. Mm-hmm. It's actually not, what's rooting it in the customer's mind. Now, what's interesting is, you know, good design goes to heaven and bad design is everywhere. It's the same thing with good customer service and bad customer service. You notice it when it's bad. And so then there is an emotional trigger and you feel like, yeah, I'm having, and then, and then there's, you know, bots and socially reviewing stuff. And so then that creates, but what that is, is just an extrapolation of a feedback group. And I'll give you an example. If I told you a story, I could tell you the same story, but I could tell you uh, like I was the biggest victim. 
or I could tell you that story to make you sad, or I could tell you like I was Pollyanna and as I was going to Brooklyn, uh, like I could tell you to you like I was a chimpanzee or in a made up language. The story doesn't change, but the framing and the signals around it do. And really what actually emotions are in the brand context, I want to be very clear here. In the brand context, um, emotions are a feedback loop. They are objective responses to a subjective experience. Mm. So how people feel, if I'm creating a customer experience timeline from the moment they hear about me to the delivery, to the onboarding, to the offboarding, to, and I'm checking in all the way, all that's doing is it's reassuring me that I am creating the right outcome that I wanted to. And so the the science shows that the emotional experience of brands and emotional connectivity, you know, there's those those few people who change their names to, you know, Dolce and Gabbana or like, you know, people will change their name to Gatorade or something because they it's but like, really, do they love it that much? Like on the broad spectrum, does everybody really love their brands? We don't actually have the capacity to mentally. We don't have the capacity to have that much of an emotional engagement with over the, the 1,000 brands. By the time we've gotten up and brushed our teeth this morning, we've like interacted with like at least 250. So we don't really have emotional attaches, but what they are is signaling. And it's like our psychological, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Evolutionary brain that says, ooh, red berries, poison. Don't eat these. Like, ooh, minty fresh use this like like it's it's really just a, a cognitive like yes this is what it says it is mm. and then it's reinforcing you know now when you go to a great restaurant obviously you know that great ingredients create great food so that's why you see like grass fed beef and free range and organic then you go to like lower cost food places and it's like fluffy yellow eggs <laughs> like burnt toasty muffin like the adjectives are even different because they have to be because the quality may not be there. And so the emotional experience you have will just reinforce that, yes, this was the experience that we wanted to create. Um, and, and you're totally right. Uh, there is this inclusion of, of values and things that is not been present in the past. Uh, but what we still see today, and, and I'm still seeing that the the um, socially justice driven brands who make it about the mission first actually struggle to succeed. If you look at Tom's shoes, um, there's, there's a whole, that's another ep There's like five episodes where <laughs> I know but <laughs> there's, but the, it's very, very difficult when the mission is first and foremost, it actually now becomes like a triple bottom line, the company, the customer, the environment, and then some like the, it's, it's, it's now expected to be part of the package and if you aren't doing good, then you're the minority. So um, it's it's another feedback loop that helps reinforce that, yes, this is a reason you should buy the brand. And once you notice the brand, you're attracted to it, you find out those things. And that's another way to keep you engaged is really what that turns into. Well, I, uh, yeah, I think you you were right about the five Q and O five episodes because we gotta <laughs> wrap this one up. But I, I think we could do a whole series about this because all the different we just touched on a bunch of elements. Because I one of the questions I wanted to ask was it, your perception of if AI and generative AI had a huge impact on VR that made entire VR environments possible, and then everybody started using it because the tech was available and the bandwidth increase and all these different factors happened. What would happen if a brand was able to create the entire visual environment that somebody sees and then show them anything that they want? What could they do with that? But I'm not going to ask that question right sure. now, but that's the type of question I want to talk about. Next well, I got a short one for you. But we're seeing we're seeing customized visual engagement happen. Uh, I believe it's with Delta when people walk through the, the little Delta uh, the little Delta portico, it'll like basically tell them like customized to you their view. Mm. Uh, we saw some great examples of this uh, in, um, in Minority Report, which was suggested uh, that wow. gap. And it was like, hello, Mr. Nakamoto. How did you enjoy that that sweater? And because he had had, you know, uh, had gotten somebody's eyes, which identified as someone else's. But, you know, we're, we're seeing clever ways that people are trying to utilize technology um, at the end of the day, whether it is AI or whether it's the brand, there has to be strategy behind it to help create 
Um, and, and we see a lot of these guerrilla experiments and guerrilla advertising that really get out there and that are immersive. We're seeing a lot of immersive experiences, the Van Gogh immersive experience, the Disney immersive experience. And, and we're trying to translate that. And so uh, it's only a matter of time before some of those ways become expected. And then things like, you know, um, you know, with the metaverse or whatever, like, ah, eh, that really didn't, we didn't, that really didn't kick off. That really didn't. So some of these things we have to just try and see. And at the end of the day, uh, we're going to have to see, like, does it, does it bring in money? Like, does it work? And is it sustainable? And that's actually, you know, the, you know, Too can I do it? Will it work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I do it? Will it work? Is it profitable? Just because yes. you can do it, just because you work. But is it make sense for you? Is it worth investing in? So is it practical? So you're right on about that. They're right on. That's a great, great, great topic. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll come up with a whole podcast series around this because I think branding doesn't get anywhere near enough attention. And all these elements, I think, are coming to a head now because I think the the tech is kind of caught up to where society kind of expects things to be. Because nothing we talked about is is crazy or unexpected or even unusual. It's stuff that all marketers should want to accomplish all the time. But we just get so distracted with individual path. Sure. So sure. we'll definitely do that. Um, and we'll have you back on very soon because I want to keep talking about this. Uh, in the meantime, uh, where can people learn more? And uh, and actually, we're going to have that download in the uh, notes as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. So yeah. Um, so if you want to learn more about brain science, uh, we've got a program. It's a revolutionary 10-week program, an intensive, I like to call it. And if you identify as a purpose-driven leader. You want to create an actionable plan. You want to help your team do a better job. You want to help your brand grow. If you're in charge of the day-to-day, -day, or even if you're the CMO or the director of marketing there, uh, we've got a 10-week program uh, where you can create an actual plan, learn about the tenets of brand science, and then um, implement strategies together uh, so you can help learn how to become an industry leader in your category. And that's called Brandpreneur. So you can check more about Brandpreneur um, on our website, our website simply is quantumbranding.agency, or you can go to brandpreneur.co um, and you can check that out. Um, you can also download uh, that distinctive brand assets check checklist um, in the show notes as well. And that's simply bit.ly forward slash brand science checklist so that lives in the interwebs forever. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. You, you've obviously done a lot of deep thinking on the subject. Uh, I love how you've kind of broken everything down. And we can definitely talk about any individual subject with individual episodes. So we'll plan on doing that. So be sure to check back uh, soon for more of Stephen's content. And uh, thank you again, Stephen, for coming on because this has been... Uh, oh, you bet. And thanks for listening today. Uh, and be sure to check out more great episodes here with Digital Marketer and Mark. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for listening. Be sure to hit that follow button so you get notified when all of our new episodes release. Please share this with a friend who's clueless about digital marketing. And don't forget to check it, check out digitalmarketing.com where you can access all of our courses, certifications, and training programs. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time.